Okay, first I want to say that this class should be Rafua Shlema for Ora Olga Badnekadam Nelia. Should be Rafua Shlema Mama should have no pain anywhere in her body, not emotionally, not psychologically, not physically, not spiritually. She'd have a complete healing in every, every level. And her family should be blessed with every single blessing. Yes. No. Okay. Everyone, everyone's included. Everyone who's sick. Everyone who's sick should have healing, um, but you should know, everyone should know that Hasidu teaches that healing comes from Chochmah. Healing comes from, from, what's this? Michael, Ben, Elanit. Lilui Nishmat, David, Ben, Ephraim. Okay. Okay. That Rafua, you have one? No. Rafua comes from Chochmah. The more Chochmah you get, meaning the more Rabbeinu's Torah you get, the more you're going to heal. The more you're going to heal. Okay? But you need to keep taking it in. We don't realize because we think we're okay, even though we know we're not okay. And we, and, and we say, okay, how much do I really have to be busy with it? We don't realize that in Mitzrayim, they were at the 49th gate of Tuma. If you look at the accounts of Mitzrayim and you look at what we're going through now, I am I would be hard pressed to say that it was worse there. And I've heard from different uh, rabbis that we actually are now at the 50th. We're already there. But because we have the Torah, so there's a way to heal. So we won't be ex we won't be extinguished because of that. So if you want to wonder to yourself, well, how sick am I that I need so much healing? The sickest. And I know we feel it because every day we're confused and we we we're sad and we're angry and we're anxious and we feel like nothing's matzliach and nothing's working out. But we don't equate that with that there's something actually wrong. We just feel like something in the world hasn't taken place yet, okay? But Rabbi Nachman makes it very clear that we, we're really, really far and we need a lot of light. So as much as you need, go soak it up, okay? So now listen to the, where we're at in the Torah right now. This is a very, very, very important section of this Torah, probably one of the most important sections in all of the Kutumaran, where he discusses what is it about the Tzadik Emet that makes him different, that makes him so substantial, Who's ever phone that is, if they could just put that on vibrate, silent, whatever, whosoever it is. Thank you. And that is that the, the essence of the Tzadik Emet is that he has reached complete humility. In the language of Kabbalah, he has reached the highest sphere, which is called Keter. Keter in Kabbalah is called the unknowable head. Now, on paper, it sounds like it's unknowable because it's so high. It's so lofty, we don't know anything about it. But Kabbalah explains that even if you got there and you knew everything there, you still wouldn't know anything. We don't have to contemplate this too much. But Rabbi Nachman used to say, my teachings are so hidden that even when I reveal them, they're still hidden from you. <laughs> okay? What, what is he alluding to? That my teachings are coming from that place of Keter. How does a person get to that place of Keter? He has to have completely, 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 completely nullified his yesh, his ego, his physicality. He has reached the ultimate spiritual, physical level of mastery of every level of himself. And this very few people in history have done. Okay? So, because of that, when you're near him, you become absorbed, so to speak, in that space, even though you're not holding by that place. That by simply going over to that person and, and uh, unloading what's going on in your heart, he then automatically lifts that back up to Hashem because he's not really there. I remember I was doing my Hibodah dude in the woods and I prayed to Hashem, one of my main prayers almost every day, if not every day, for years is help me to be a ray of man. Help me to be a faithful shepherd. That everything that I say only brings a person closer to good. 
closer to you, that I don't chas v'shalom say anything or do anything that should ever bring anybody further from you. Help me to have good eitzah about how to continue to improve in this area and 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 only to lead people to Muna, real Muna. I came out of Hippo to do one time. I was crying really intensely about it. I was screaming, crying. I came out and I saw a random guy there and he was looking at the trees and I was walking by. I said, how are you doing? Because you can't get by the path with that guy there. He said, I'm doing great. How are you? I said, good. He said, what are you up to? I said, I just did this thing called Hippo to do. He goes, oh, I also do Hippo to do. I go, oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. he said but my hippo to do is a little different i look at nature and i just look how beautiful it is and how shem is so much i was thinking of daniel i go oh that's so nice and then he said the most random thing to me seemingly he goes you know what was amazing about the lubavitch rabbi and i was like boy he said that when the person went to go see him and speak to him he wasn't there yeah, he said, what do you mean? He said he was so humble that when you spoke to him, you didn't see him at all. You didn't feel him at all. You just felt Hashem. And I and I see Mamash, it was Hashem talking to me. Mamash, Hashem speaking to me. He answered to my prayer. Nothingness. People were healed just by speaking to him. It doesn't make sense. He, no, to the Rebbe. That they would come into his room, they have an audience with him, and by the time they left, whatever was going on in their life was taken care of. He may not have even given them Eitzah advice, and they felt like the problem was over. How is that possible? Because when you get to a level of nothingness, where there's no you anymore, only your godly soul, that's the place of healing. And this is the place that Rebbe Nachman achieved. Okay? So now he says like this. There is, so to speak, a place called the Shem's Ratzon. That's Keter. That's another word for Keter. His Ratzon. This Ratzon is truly unknowable. Even if we know the 613 mitzvot, and even though that is his Ratzon, still his Ratzon in and of itself is unknowable. Because he is unlimited. So that means his Ratzon is unlimited. How can you know something that has no limits and no bounds? You can't. His Ratzon is one of those things, okay? However, how does he make his Ratzon known in the world? So Rabbi Nachman says through each of you. Each of you is a different Ratzon of Hashem, that he made Paul Till look, feel, experience life in a certain way. He has one Ratzon in the world called Paul Till. He has another person who listens to really, really, really sad, cheesy music every day. And he's a really handsome guy. He's got great, great skin tone. Yeah, <laughs> and he has tremendous Mesir Nefesh to try and get closer to the truth that even when the whole world is mom is drinking on rooftops and he could be doing it, he's here trying to get closer to an age old truth that's thousands and thousands of years old. <laughs> Yaakov, Eli. So Eli is another Ratzon of Hashem. And I go on and on and on with all of you. You're all a different Ratzon of Hashem. How does Rabbi Nachman know that you are for sure a Ratzon of Hashem? That you exist. Why are you different than him? Because you're a different Ratzon of Hashem. Rabbi Nachman says when a tzaddik is by a person, a Jew, and he's connecting to them, he's looking for where is Hashem's Ratzon in that person? Where is the unique Ratzon that they're revealing in the world? Because they have to be. That's why it's different than him and different than him. So therefore, all of us collectively are different individual rut zones of Hashem. But if you take all those individual rut zones and you bring them to the level of Keter, it's all one undifferentiated rut zone. So now he says like this. This is in a very famous Gemara. Listen to how he explains this Gemara. It's so beautiful when you understand this so the secret. Because we're learning that Malchut is reveal the concept of malchut which is the lowest spiritual level malchut means the revealed will that is what you look like that's the revealed will your ego your yeshness your somethingness very simply your somethingness your individuality is called malchut 
But at the level of the Ratzon of your soul, there is no individuality. You have no ego. It's completely nullified. You're only nothing. That's the highest level of your soul. That's not called yesh. That's called ayin. And we know that Chazal teach that Hashem created everything yesh ma'ayin, something from nothing, you included. Not just something from nothing, meaning uh, I created it out of nowhere, abracadabra. Meaning that there is a something, the ultimate something is called nothing. And your somethingness was created from that nothingness. Everybody still with me? I know this is a little deep. <laughs> so the next time says, brother man, you nothing. You go damn right. I'm nothing. I am nothing. And you say it loud and you say it proud. You know why? Because you're nothing. <laughs> because it's the highest level. Nothing. Then you have no limits. Because what happens when you're something, and let's say you deal with anger, so you have that something anger. Let's say you're sad, and you have that something sadness. How can I ever move beyond these negative emotions, which are not even my fault, and I had them since childbirth, and I'm dealing with them every single day? You have to eliminate your somethingness. You have to nullify your somethingness and get to connect to your nothingness. Because when you reach the point of nothingness, all of your yesh, all of your somethingness, your ego, both the parts of you that you feel really gishmak about, which may not even be so gishmak, and the parts of you that are holding you back, that's when they all get transformed. Avram Avinu didn't have it within himself to have a child. It was not within his somethingness to have a child. However, when he got to the place of complete bitul, that he reached negation of ego completely, he had a child. Why? Because at the place of nothingness, nothing has to be. Anything can be. But at the place of somethingness, whatever is, is what's going to be. How does a person experience a miracle? He needs to achieve nothingness. Is everybody with me on this? Rabbi Nachman has the craziest tour at the end of Lakut Maran, which they say is from Sefer and Nisraf. He says, your ability to have things in your life that are not destined for you, let's say Parnasa, because we know according to Chazal, the amount of Parnasa in your life you're going to make in your whole life is already predetermined. So let's say I'm not making money. How can I change that? You would only be ever, to, if ever able to change that if it's not in your Mazal. That is if you achieve your real Mazal, which is called nothingness. And that requires be tool of the ego. Now, obviously, this is a big issue for us because we're men. What happens to men? They have gigantic egos. Now, if you add to the fact that you're Sephardi, amp it up. And if you add to the fact that you're Bukharian, yesh, 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 all the way. Because if you don't yesh, you're a joke. What, is everybody going to stomp on me? Everybody's going to take advantage of me? Me, 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 me. But what are you nullifying? The ability for Hashem to create new realities for you. Because as long as you're just you, you're going to continue to have your limited life. But once you can eliminate that ego, then you have no limits anymore because you tap into the highest part of yourself, which is called nothingness. In that place, Hashem can give you brand new realities, a child, Parnassah, a wife, um, peace within yourself. You can remove your anger, your sadness. That's the place of transformation. Okay. So now listen to this Gemara that is very famous from Masech and Megillah. And listen to what he says. In every place that you find the greatness of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, Shama Tamotse Anvatunato. You find this humility. Did everybody ever hear that Gemara before? Very famous Gemara. And the place that you find Hashem's greatness, there you find this humility. So simply, what does it mean? It means his greatness is the fact that he's so humble, that he's not concerned with himself. He only wants to give. The closer you get to him, the more humble you will be. You have to be that way. To the degree that you become humble, to that degree you experience Hashem as he actually is. Good. 
the less humble you are, the more you experience Hashem is out to get you. He's causing you to struggle. He's making life difficult for you. He's causing you problems. The reason and the problem doesn't lie with Hashem. The problem lies with our ego. Because you mirror, or Hashem in your mind mirrors how your inner life is. If your inner life is broken, you're going to feel like Hashem is breaking you. But if you're to nullify your ego and you attain humility, then you see Hashem like Moshe did. The Redeemer. The Tovu Metiv, the one who's good and who does good. The whole difference between people who they mamish feel joy in their life at every moment and those people who don't is one thing. One of those people is concerned only with themselves and the other one has no concern for themselves. That's it. So if you want to ask yourself, how can I get to the point that I'm ever going to be really happy? When you nullify your ego. So now we're saying that Hashem, wherever you find His greatness, there you're going to find His humility. Another explanation of this is very beautiful. In the professional world, who do you want to have Haskama from? Who do you want to have recognition from? Those people who are at a high level, right? Who made it. That would be your greatest kishmak. Let's say you're in the clothing industry. You're making clothing. Who do you want to hear from? I don't know who makes like the best clothing, but if they come out and they say, wow, this is a young and coming guy and this guy's making really hot clothing and X, Y, and Z. So you're going to feel amazing about that. But what happens if you hear David Kalman say, wow, that's a sweet shirt. You're not going to feel anything about that. You might even go back and reconstruct and redesign that shirt just because I said that. Or burn it. <laughs> burn it. <laughs> this is a fail, okay? But Hashem is very interesting. Who does he love to hear Haskama from? That they're happy with him? The lowest. the lowest of the low. The orphans, the widows, the poor. He wants them specifically to say, Hashem, I love you. I'm very happy with my life. It's a very deep thing. You hear what I'm saying? This is why, by the way, Rabbi Nachman was busy hanging with those people who were the ones who were struggling the most because he was emulating Hashem. It's very easy and comfortable to hang out with those people who are considered normal, workable, helpable, X, Y, and Z. And you have great outcome results. Yeah, whatever. And then you're going to have a good success rate. You keep moving up in the field. But what does Hashem love? He loves the orphan, and he loves the widow. He loves the ger. Rabbi Nachman says a ger is the concept of a balchuva. He loves the balchuva. He loves those people who are in the greatest darkness. Why was Rabbi Nachman always trying to connect to those who were furthest? Because this is the concept of the tzaddik emet. This is the concept of the true tzaddik. Because wherever you find his greatness, there you find his humility. He didn't want to be with those people who were saying, I made it. He wanted to be with those people who are saying, I don't know what to do with my life. Because Hashem is like that. Okay? Now listen to what Rabbi Nachman says, though, about this Gemara. Wherever you find the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hainu, meaning his malchut. What's his greatness? Meaning his revealed Self, which is your somethingness. I know this is very philosophical, but try to stay with me. Your somethingness is called Hashem's greatness. Because His greatness, so to speak, is whatever things actually mamish look like. So that's called yourself. We're, you with me? Okay, so now look at what He says, though. Hainu Ritzo note. Meaning, you see one of His wills, one of His wills is called your somethingness. Whatever exists, this is one of Hashem's wills. This is one of Hashem's wills. This is his gedula toh. This is his greatness, that he can make something from nothing. However, wherever you find that, what are you going to find? You'll find his humbleness. Hainu, meaning ratzon einsof. You're going to find the ratzon of the einsof. Because what is actually giving birth to this somethingness? Nothingness. His humility. So he's saying, what, the, what does the Gemara really mean? Wherever you find something, if you look hard enough, you'll find nothing. Meaning you'll find Hashem's Ratzon. 
And that is the key to healing. Wherever you find something, it means Hashem created it. And if Hashem created it, what's the highest level of His creation? What's the source of His creation? His Ratzon. His Ratzon is in the sphere that's called Keter. Keter is called nothingness. The fact that Hashem created Yesh Ma'ayin, meaning He made you from nothing. So what's your highest potential? Nothing. What's your lowest potential? Something. I know that this is very, very deep, but it's a very important thing. Yes, it's a very deep concept. I'm trying to simpl try simplify. Dumb it down. Dumb it down the yes. Thank you. Oh, we understand. Yes. But then, but then you don't. She gives me the dot, and then like. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ready? I know. No. No. I'm just. You know. <laughs> okay. Like this. How can it be that the Jewish people are ever going to have unity? Think, think about it practically, logically. You go into any Beit Knesset in this area, and what are you going to find? Machloken. Mm -hmm. Now, we want to, on, on not just on this scale, not even on a national scale, we want to have on a global scale that every Jew loves each other. Does that sound practical to you? Does that sound realistic to you? No. Nope. Do you even love the guy sitting? You don't have to say. I do. At what point, at what level could you love a fellow Jew? No matter what. <laughs> at his level of at his level of nothingness. Meaning the fact that Hashem created him, that means that that's Hashem's Ratzon. And that's what you love. That's the part that you love. That's what you focus on. You don't focus on his somethingness, his challenges, his difficulties, his lackings. You focus on his... Azama. Yeah. His, no, but... But, but Nakudas Tovas. And what is Nakuda Tovas? Those good points? They're Hashem's Ratzon. At that level, everything is good. And that level I can love. So very, very simply, okay? We have over here, again, can I have one of these chicken things? Can I have one of the? No, I just want. I'm not gonna eat it. I just. <laughs> you can have two. <laughs> okay. Is this something or is this nothing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. Try it. <laughs> How many licks does it take? What would you do right now? <laughs> Benny always tells me this. That's a part of like what I really need to do is have this vanish in the middle of me speaking. You guys would bug well, out. <laughs> and you don't even eat it. Something. You would go. you do? What would you do? Would you get all your boys over here right now if I said it? It's oh. something or is it nothing? And I go <laughs> like this. <laughs> okay. This is something, right? But that's in the physical world. However, there is a neshama to this drumstick. There's a soul to this. Is that soul something or it's nothing? It's something? It's physical? There's yesh? It's not physical. There's a spiritual energy which is giving life force to this. How do we know that for a fact? just because it exists. There's nothing that can exist in the physical world if it's not drawing down spiritual life force. If it wasn't having spiritual life force, it could not physically exist. Is everybody with me right now? I'm gonna, I'm any, object I'm, object any, object any object, any person, any situation, any somethingness must have a soul, must have a spiritual reality which is giving it life force. For instance, the fact that we're even all together, this is a situation that's taking place. This is something. What does that mean for a fact? There is a spiritual higher reality which is causing and influencing all of us to be together right now. Does that make sense? No. no. Obviously nothing is for no reason. We're all here. For a reason. a reason. That reason, it's called its soul. That reason, it's called its soul. 
That is what you need to connect to in order for you to derive benefit from the something. For instance, if I eat this drumstick just because it tastes good, which it does, and you can go to this restaurant at the hours. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a wonderful drumstick, okay? If I eat this just because it tastes good, do you know what's going to happen to me? I'm only connecting to the physical. And then what's going to be the result? I'm Somethingness. And what does somethingness do to a person? It makes him tired. It, 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 it takes away his energy. Because what am I doing? I'm eating something. Anything that's something is going to take my energy. Anytime I'm ever at the level of something, it's going to take my energy. Eat, no, to you have to eat. Physicality drains and, 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 and takes, it's a receiver of energy. So when you do anything just for the sake of the fact that it's physical, you're tapping into the level of, what's the word? What is that thing called? Uh, no, it's like a leech or a parasite or a... It, it drains, it, 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 it uh, sucks, sucks the light, it, it sucks the life force from that thing. They call that something. Parasite. Parasite. Okay. So at the level of a physical reality, when you go do something that's just purely physical for the sake of it being physical, that is actually going to take away your energy. Even though what's the purpose that Hashem created the food? To give you energy. Not to take away your energy, to give you energy. So why is it that every time that we eat, we feel tired after. No. What does that mean? What does that mean according to what we're saying? I'm making it very simple for you. Physicality conceals godliness. But when I take something physical and I do it for a spiritual reason, I reveal its essence. Lishma. And then what happens? I get life force from it. I get life force. Why from would it. you eat that if you were to eat it? On a, on a higher level, let's say I had worked on this. I'm eating this either at one higher level. It would just be I'm eating this in order to have energy to go learn, to go pray, to go get closer to Hashem. But there's an even higher level that a mom is ripping. Uh, there's a very deep concept in Kabbalah that food has a lot of sparks of godliness in it. That's the reason why we eat it. And, I, and then at a higher level, you can literally, I already did, you can literally um, remove those sparks and that's what gives you life force. So to speak, you eat the letters of the food. You have to have a every time you do that. We were not holding there yet. No, I'm just asking. You have to go step by step. <laughs> what would be your first step that you could do? I'm going I'm eating this in for a higher goal. I'm not eating this just to eat. I'm eating it in order for something to happen. That's the <laughs> you're not. I know you're Sephardi, so you wanna you wanna go there. <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, no, but you're you're not you're not there yet. You can't you are you, not at the level. And when you're at a certain level, according to Rabbi Nachman, you would just see letters when you see the chicken. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is everything in life. This is also a situation in life. Let's say, for instance, you go home now and you had a business deal and all of a sudden it blew up. That whole situation is something. What does that automatically mean? That that something has a soul has a spiritual reality which is giving birth to that situation. If you just take the thing at face value, what's going to happen from the situation? It's going to suck out all your energy. Does that make sense? You're going to be stressed. You're going to be worried. You're going to be concerned. You're going to go into yeush. But what if instead of responding at face value to the something that's taking place, I say whatever is happening, or I don't know why I keep thinking this drumstick. I, whatever is happening to me right now, <laughs> whatever is happening right now is exactly what Hashem wants to be taking place. It's the best possible thing that could be happening to me. It's only in order to bring me closer to him. What is that going to make me feel? 
energy, life force, joy. What's the difference between these two things? You have one choice in your life. You choose something or you choose nothing. In every situation, whether... You understand, right? Whether... Okay, how'd it go? Okay, it's not mine. I'm just... But you hear what we're saying? Everything in life is like this. What's the difference between, let's say, at this point, me and someone listening to me? I have been working for years... I'm not taking things at face value. That I'm momish every time I go do it, do it, Hashem, please help me to see the hochman in this. Help me to look for the soul in this. Help me to see Hashem's rotzon in this. Not to take things at face value, because Rabbi Nachman says in the first Torah of the Kutim Aran, all of the negativity in your life comes from taking things at face value. Nothing is just happening. Every something is coming from nothing, from Hashem's rotzon. If you focus on the something part of it, it's going to lead you to anger, sadness, despair, fear, X, Y, and Z, because the whole concept of something is it hides Hashem. Yes, I just gave you one. Business, I gave you one. You go home right now. You've been, okay, good. Good, I got one for you, ready? Let's say, for instance, you're dating a girl. Why are you laughing? And you're living like you're living. You're enjoying it? <laughs> this is not a doorman mentality. I no, just wait. Wait, just wait, just wait. Okay, listen. You're saying he's not you're saying he's not on the level of making the we're not. I'm also not. None of us are. We're not on the level of 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 of, of, of perceiving the letters in the food. Right. But what you're saying is also on a very uh, no, 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 no. Very simply. What in the world is that? No, how is there music coming from the pickles? <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> yes. Okay, focus, focus. Ellie, 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 this is not a mitzvah what you're doing right now. This is a mitzvah because right now I'm connected. No, you're distracting everybody with your mitzvah, with your pickles. That was perfect. Okay, nobody talk. Everybody stop talking. Whoa, 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 whoa. Do something about it. Whoa. Whoa. You saw what just happened there? Do you see what Hashem just did there? Hashem said no pickles. Nothing. Nothing. Will you tell me? It was Rob David Thomas with an all of our eyes on that. No. No, don't take it on face value. What spilled out water? Water before. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you lost all the Torah from what you were trying to do. He's still he, still he, still <laughs> he can't stop himself. <laughs> Something. Okay. Amen. Listen, very simply. You're going. Okay, everybody stop yeah. focusing on the pickles and the juice. Okay. Guys, guys, it's fine. He's going to be fine. He's going to make it. Okay, listen. You're dating a girl. Okay. Everything's going great. Uh, <laughs> Kaif, you walk home one day after a nice date. She says, I had an amazing time. You walk home, you get a text. I'm sorry, I'm not interested. Uh, Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, brother. Okay, so now listen. Everything was flowing right. Everything was flowing good. And then one second, she's done. If you take that at face value, what is your response going to be? But you just said everything was good five seconds ago. I'm a loser. Wait, listen. I'm a loser. Good. I'm a loser. Why? Something's wrong with me. Why, Why does it keep happening? I misread, I misread it. I thought she was the one. I'm going to die alone. I'm going to die alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paul Thiel never got to experience Ellie before. Thank God. This is good. Um, there's another way to approach that. And this Rebbe Nachman says is a chiyuv. You must. This is not a spiritual madrega. This is what makes you Jewish, your ability to do this. This is what Hashem wants. Everything that Hashem wants is the best possible thing that could be happening to me. Why is it the best possible thing? Because it's going to bring me closer to Him. Boom. That's it. Very simple. When you focus on that first part, 
That's what causes all of your suffering because somethingness is what causes suffering. But if you focus on the soul of the situation, which is not for deep Hasidic Kabbalistic masters, Rabbi Nachman says it's a chiyuv, that every Jew needs to do this. That you need to look for where is Hashem in it. That's it. And when you find it, then connect your inner reality, your emotions, your mind, your thoughts, your actions to that soul, to that rut zone. Yes. You have to cry to Hashem. How do you cry to Hashem when you're first overwhelmed with a wave of a sadness? You don't get overwhelmed with a wave of sadness. Sadness comes as a result of your negative thinking. You must have first had a negative thought. Even if it was so subtle, you must have thought to yourself, here we go again. Something. You cannot feel sad naturally. You must have, you must have invested in some type of reality in your mind before it took place. That is what I keep saying over and over. You got it now. Okay, Paul Thiel is going to teach you after class. Very, very easy to say, but when it's hard to apply sometimes. I know it's very hard. Very good. So you're saying good. So what do you do? So, so what does Rabbi Nachman say? What is the key to you being able to actually do that in all the situations in your life? Take it to Ibotid. Very good. Thank you, Daniel. What is my ability to be able to do this? That it's now my normative way of thinking. That another person has the same thing that happens as I do, but his response is way different and much more destructive. And my response might actually and will bring me good and blessing. The reason I'm able to just silence. The reason I'm able to do this is because every day for years, for at least an hour a day, I'm praying to Hashem to be able to do this. What is between your head and your heart? Your mouth. What is it that bridges? He's like, what is it? <laughs> What is it that bridges your mind and your heart? Your mouth. The reason why Rabbi Nachman says you need to take an hour to speak to Hashem every single day is because the only way you're going to be able to actually experience your life as you want to or you hope to in your mind is by asking Hashem to. And if you don't do that, you can never bridge what's in your mind to your heart. Is everybody with me? Can I tell you something? Again, this doesn't make any sense to me. If I told you I had a business deal for you and every single day you do something for an hour, you're going to have a certain amount of money. You're not going to say my life comes up. You're going to be there. Okay, so stop. Not you. I'm just saying all of you. That life got like, no, just, it, it's just, stop. Everybody keeps telling me, but my life comes up. When am I going to have time to do it? I'm, I'm no, do. I'm just okay. Sorry, I, I just I, I've heard this so many times. You know what it is? A lot of people look at it both do, like exercise. If you have extra time to do it, I know that. I know that. But it's a, a lot of time for a person who wants to live a healthy lifestyle. You would go to the gym. Watch no, but it, the, but the fact of the matter is, there's people who even though they know exercise makes them feel good, and know. even though they bought the gym membership. And even though they were looking forward to it, and even though they planned it in their calendar, they went one time and they stopped going because there's a Yetzirah that doesn't want you to go. But all I'm saying is you need to reallocate what pumps you up. If what drives you is making money, then consider this like this is my business deal. Yeah. Whatever drives you. I don't think like that. So I have to make something up for myself to get myself there. But if you do, so make that up for yourself. You have to be tricky with your Yetzirah, whatever it takes. I heard there's a guy who mamas docks himself money if he doesn't do an hour a day. That's what he does. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. You got to figure it out. But the person yeah, cannot tell me, what if just in my day I don't have time? You don't have time for nothing. When you get, I know not you. What if the situation comes and you can't just, you can just run out and just do this? No, no, what I'm saying is that by doing the Hibo to do it every day, then when the situation takes place, your response initially is going to be different. That's what I'm saying. Okay. You're not going to have the same initial response, but you have to be praying on it every day. Okay. I'm not doing an hour though. I'm doing like 15 minutes to 30 minutes. Okay. 
So, so you have to have a goal of getting to the hour. You have to have a goal of getting to the hour. It doesn't mean you have to be there. You're doing good. You're doing good. Look, I'm not trying to take away anything from anybody, but I know that the people who are sitting in this class, why in this class? Because they want results. Is that true or not true? Okay. So now I can make you feel good and tell you 15 minutes a day is really good. It is really good. It's 15 minutes more than 99.9% .9 of the rest of the world is doing. It's a mitzvah gedola. At the same time, when do you experience the fruit of Rabbi Nachman's teachings? When you do exactly what he says. That's it. He says one hour? He says at least one hour. So if you do more, you get even richer? Sure. Can you have a student who did like 16? What? Can you have a student who did like 16 hours? Yeah, he had one student who... <laughs> He had a student. He had a student. I believe it. He had a student. I believe his name is Rav Shmuel Yitzchak, and he was he was known for being able to literally being able to do he to do literally all day. Yes. We're gonna wait for the questions in a little bit. I know we got like into a thing. I just I just thought it was important, so I went into it. But just we're gonna come back out now, okay? So now listen to what he says. Meaning, wherever you find his greatness, his somethingness, there you find his humility. Meaning, at a higher level, his rut zone is there. But you can only perceive that when you're humble. You hear? Why is it that a tzaddik, when you go to see him, he's able to tell you, oh, this is why it's happening to you. This is the good in it. And you are not able to see that. Because he's humble and you're not. That's it. That's it. When a humble, humble, he's humble. He is not ego oriented. His what drives him is not self oriented. What drives him is something greater than him. And when a Jew is able to get to that point, that everything that drives him, no matter what he does, whether it's eating or drinking or hanging out with his wife or going on a date or playing ball with his friends, and everything is driven by a higher goal than something for me, you reach what's called anava, and you're able to obtain deep spiritual insights without even having to think about them. You mamish can see the hochma in something without even trying. Humility. What does it mean? You stripping yourself of your somethingness. Okay. In the Shulchan Aruch, you'll look at the laws of tefillah. It's going to tell you there that there's a Gemara in Masechet Brachot that they used to take an hour before they prayed. What were they doing? The Shulchan Aruch says, he pastut gashmiut. They were leaving their bodies. And that sounds like a very high level. I don't know about you, the last time I left my body was at a concert festival in Atlantic City seven years ago. Okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay? No, I mean, I wasn't kidding. Okay, well, what am I saying? <laughs> no, I, I didn't. He thought you were making it. Hey, no, no. no, I did. But what, what, what's, what, what is he talking about here? Meaning, for one hour, they were taking themselves and they were obtaining bittel. Meaning, when I come to pray and I'm busy with myself, what's going to happen? What does it look like when you guys come to pray? Hey, what's going on? How you doing over there? <laughs> Back at you. <laughs> oh my gosh. I get dizzy from looking at you guys. Where is that coming from? Yesh. Distractions that's coming from somethingness. Why? Why? Distractions. We're unsettled. Why? Because we're not happy. Why? Because we're not connecting. Because you, you are, you have to be... Because we're something. something. We're in a lie. Because you're something. Because you're still, yeah, you're investing in the lie of your something. 
can you be distracted? If you do it, you have no Rabbi Nachman says, it's a, listen, listen, Bezrat Hashem. Rabbi Nachman says, if you pray, it is, it is a sore for you to do the Arizal's Kavanot when you pray. I know you guys all have those Sephardi Sidorim with the Arizal's Kavanot on it. Wait, what did you say? It says you're not allowed to do the Arizal's Kavanot when you pray. What? He says you must simply mean the words that you say. Why does he say that? I mean, you understand. No, you must mean the word. Yeah, of course you have to understand. But you must mean the words that you say. Because what happens when you mean the words that you say? Where is it I'll show you. This is Rabbi Nachman. This is not what everybody says. I'm just telling you, Rabbi Nachman says uh-huh. his students are not allowed to do the Arizal's Kavanot. No, and he says you should not be doing them because he says that the, the people who do the Kavanot, that they really are, are, are holding by it. For them, that's what they see when they do the simple reading. They're not having to look for the kavanot. They see it just like you see the word. They're not trying to do the kavanot. That's what they see. When you look at the book, you say, Hashem. When the Arizo looks at the book, he sees letters of Hashem's names. But he says, whoever it is, wherever they're holding, everyone's trying to do one thing, mean what they say. For the Arizal, he means Kavanot. For you, you need to mean the words. How do you mean, what happens when you mean the words? Let's say you're looking at words and your mom is saying them and you're meaning them. Do you know what happens to you? What happens to you? Bittles you. Your your ego goes into self-nullification. Because when you mean what you're saying, you lose track of time. You lose track of space. You lose track of yourself. What's the reason we're all suffering? We don't mean anything because we're scared out of our minds to sit down and do something because we think we're going to lose out on everything. Why? Because the yesh is the strongest now than it's ever been. The ego is the strongest now than it's ever been. It's making us all feel like the biggest something. And because of that, we're all sad, angry, confused, and scared. So Rabbi Nachman says, take the Siddur and say Baruch and mean what you say. Ata, you, you're saying to Hashem, you. Say it, mean it. Hashem, Elokeinu, Melech HaOlam, that you're literally the one who's orchestrating all of you. Just mean what you say. No mystical kava, no, no nothing. You know what's going to happen when you mean what you say? You're going to disappear. You're going to enter into the insult. You're going to enter into nothing.